do you think Lewis is a good character? I think most of you will say yes. How many of you are using Lewis? I think almost everyone will say yes. So you don't be shocked me saying that I don't use Lewis. I stopped using Lewis. I think he's actually a bad ca bad character. That is right. I think I actually believe that Lewis is a weak character. So in this video, I'll talk about the concept of getting away with it, how it affects your army, and how it also helps you in other games too. And I think the main point why it's important for Fire Emblem Engage, I said immediately, is because I see a lot of players struggling on both maddening and hard and so on, but you're using, I would say, a diversity of cast of characters, which is pointless. You don't need to have two axe users, two last users, two sword and so on, etc. I, for example, haven't used any axe users for half the chapters. I only have one sword user, which is, of course, the main character. I actually use basically like only spellcasters and archer characters. That's an effective icing, getting away strategy. Let me first then start using the concept of getting away with it. As I said earlier, if I could, not only would I stop using a tank, I would basically use only Ivy's, right? She can fly, she can do high damage, she can use obstruct, etc. This is a much better character than most cats in the game. As I said in my previous video, you should discard your old waifus for your new waifus, because the game is very deponistic in your stats, so it's very hard to keep your, your level on your characters. Meaning that when a new cat introduces, for example, when Marin comes in, she's way stronger than any other character you have, so you start using Marin. That's like a very uh, simple concept in Fire Emblem. But even more so, I think you have to also think about why are you using this class for? Like, why do you want to have a tank? What is the point of Lewis? He's only different tank, right? His damage is decent. His passive is useless on most engagement. So, for example, when I played Chapter 16, I... Started testing Lewis, somewhat tanked, right? Did some damage. But then I replay this stage, and instead I use Marin instead. Now I have a dodge tank that does like twice his damage, is even taking less damage. That's much more effective. I think a great example in Fire Emblem Games is Citren, or whoever is your main Sage Waifu. So, for example, right, I got Tord on her. So you can shoot at the enemy and do very high damage, right? She's my highest damage dealer. And this also comes into why the best class in the game is, of course, the Dancer. Why is Dancer so good character? It's because he can always give you another turn, right? So the Dancer by itself, of course, is useless, but because the Dancer can give your, you know, best character another turn, the Dancer becomes the secondary best character, right? And what that means is that if I could effectivize my army, again, getting away with it, I would have, like, only Citrens and Ivy. Basically, can almost beat every stage by just having, like, three ranged attacks. Why would I have, for example, Marin? I probably wouldn't even have Marin. I would have Yunaka as a dodge tank. And then I would have basically only, you know, three range cat. As you can see, I have Alkyrie's three range, Anna three range, Spellcaster three range, and then Dancer to do more three range high damage. Right? That's why I want to call this diversity is our weakness. And, of course, we've heard the terms many times, of course, diversity is our strength in real life then. But in Fire Emblem Engage, diversity is our weakness. It is much better having used the best classes. There is no purpose of having, like, one land sky, one berserker, one that. No, no, no. You just have, like, 12, 10, whatever, such allows you, spellcasters. More or less. Or for whatever effectivized combo you have. Right? Oh, I have, like, 12 warriors. They all can back up. We can do like 20 backup damage every time, etc. Right? That is a much better way to play it. And actually, most strategy games, right, it is much better playing this like, you know, abusive strategy. Oh, I have only this thing and so on. I think it comes back to like, why do you want to have a tank? The tank's only there, so the other cards that are actually more valuable just taking the damage. I think a good comparison is Lewis to Edelgard. Edelgard, of course, a cool waifu from Three Houses, is also the best tank in the game. What that means is that. I would say that if you play Maddening in the houses, in the beginning of Maddening, Edelgard makes the game much easier on her route, right? Because you actually get the most, most OP tank in the game. Then, of course, Cloud uh, is much, much better uh, in late game, in his route. But because Edelgard is a super good general armor tank unit, she also does much higher damage, she got a unique weapon and so on, she actually is a viable unit the whole game. Again, the best tank in the game, plus one of the highest damage dealers, right? But otherwise, in almost every strategy game, or any game generally, 
you want to maximize the, the DPS, right? The damage per second. I know it's called damage per turn. Sounds weird. DPT. Damage over turn. But whatever. You get my point. Uh, because Edelgard actually does one of the highest damage as well in your team. And is basically immortal. She, she becomes really, really viable at the whole game. Where Lewis, as soon as I could immediately swap him out to another dodge tank that has higher damage and higher mobility, like Marin, there's no purpose having a general anymore. If you simply look at how I use the store in the game, I have barely purchased any weapons, right? Sword, spear, access, you name it. Because again, I really want to iterate back to that point that I think a lot of people, when they play Fire Emblem, they're not effective wise or again, getting away with it, right? They instead, they try to be diverse. They try to play the game with like, oh, I should have like one or two Berserks and probably like, you know, one hero, right? Then I need to have like two tanks and this thing. And that's not, I think, I don't think you have to play the game like this, but I think you want to get away with it, right? I, I play the game with like, yeah, only flying units and then we just throw one. Okay, let's talk about some other games because I think this concept is very, very useful, especially for card games. But also games like Stalker and so on. And I hope this video can be useful if you're watching it. How to think about strategy and so on, right? So this is me playing Starcraft 2 here. And this is like Grandmaster, you know, the top Master League ranked players. So I'm facing a very good player. As you can see here, I'm building a set up a dune. This means that I won't have any detection. So I have spotted here, right? That he's not building a normal command set. He's not doing an expansion. And if you don't know how the game works, you have to expand right to get more money and so on. And because I see he's doing a command center up top, I know something is fishy with this thing. Uh, and that's why I build my cannon. So this is why I want to point out that a great example of getting away with it, right? Normally, if I play Starcraft 2 as Protoss, I wouldn't build a cannon in my base, right? But because I am building a Dark Shrine, Dark Templar, this means that I don't have any detection. Uh, a Terran player can drop mines, right? And then I need detection to see them, or else I lose the game, basically. So the reason I have to build my cannon is because I spotted that I, he's probably going to drop me. He's either going Banshee or he's going uh, a Widow Mind Drop, very, very likely, right? So no, I can't get away with it, so to speak, right? This is why I come back to this concept, I think it's very important for any strategy game. Where I'm thinking that, can I, not, can I get away with not building a cannon or anything similar? No, I can't, because I'm spotting something weird happening. We need to build this cannon. Here's another game against another Terran player. I think it's even the same player. He's his barcode. So this is like a Grandmaster barcode player. So I think he's the same person. Uh, as you can see in this game, I spotted that he's building some kind of weird push for me. So I'm warping out quick uh, stalkers. And I'm not building a cannon. Instead of building a Stargate. I'm building a Stargate. And the point here again is getting away with it, right? Because I know he's doing some kind of weird push. And I know that he probably is doing either Marauders or bunch of Marines. As you can see here now, I spotted this incorrectly. So I have to kite uh, his units now with my Stalkers. And uh, they have one more range Stalkers than Marines. So I can kite his units infinitely. He's here trying to rush me. But because I know he's attacking me with this SCV pool and Marines, I have to build batteries, right? And this is kind of getting away with it again, right? Uh, I think, I hope people understand the concept even if you don't play Stalkers. I normally would never build a battery here, but again, no, I need to, okay, to build a battery here. Uh, but, for example, compared to the first game, I don't need to build a cannon, right? Because I know he doesn't have any gas. So this, my opponent here, has no gas. So there's no purpose of building empty mine detection. I know I can get away with having no detection, and I have to instead kite him with my stalkers. However, what I'm getting away with this game instead, to win this game, is my stargate. Because I know that I probably actually can't hold if I don't build more stalkers or whatever, right, against all his marines and SOVs. But I know that if I get like one Voidray out, or one uh, Oracle out, those marines and SOVs are going to be useless, right? So I can easily win with just one Voidray and a battery against a couple of marines. Uh, so I'm getting away with it, right, L reducing my front army to get one tech unit out that I know can like defeat all his units. As you can see now, now I'm tank defending here, right, at the battery. He's still coming at me, my Oracle flies past him. And he's basically has lost the game now. He knows he won't be able to stop that oracle. And I can hold his marines there forever. So he leaves the game after my oracle uh, managed to fly past his marines, right? And I want to bring this out again here to hope people can understand how I think about strategy, right? By me getting away with the oracle, I compare again to Fire Emblem, it's very similar to getting away with one extra Megis unit, right? One extra IV flying or something. 
Uh, the Oracle, he knows, we both knows that if I get an Oracle out into his base, he's not going to be able to stop it, because even if he can leave Marines at home, it costs him uh, economical mining time to send things to my base, right? And he, and he doesn't have any gas. So he said cost him like all his mining time. And so he has either win right now with his army outside my base where I'm defending, right? Or he's gonna lose uh, over the time. And he knows he can't do that, right? So I got away with defending with a slightly weaker defense, right? Basically, I lowered my defense as best as I could, right? I built the bare minimum units. I kited his units all the way from his base to my base. So I could get my Oracle out quicker, right? And then he knows that he has lost now because the Oracle managed to get managed to be built basically, right? There's like no way the Marines have killed my Oracle. So it's more about that he knows that I managed to hold his push right and also checking on the same time. Most players, and I want to be rude with them, but players on a lower bracket, right? This is like Grandmaster, Master League, or players here. Because I play, you know, in, in that level, uh, a worse player would probably just build, you know, five, ten, whatever stalkers in defense, right? They would build way more defensive stuff, more batteries, more stalkers, or sentries, and hold it, right? But I am doing the absolutely bare minimum to hold it, right? The fewest units possible, mostly use kiting and micro with my stalkers, use so I can steal tech, right? And that is, again, getting away with it. I'm maximizing my damage output, or in rather this case, then the tech output, do maximum damage later, and defending with the absolute bare minimum. The best example, I ever seen of getting away with it is Flame Strike in Hearthstone. As I mentioned earlier, right, I played a lot of card games competitively, and yesterday I opened this uh, Wi-Fi card game, so you'd have been interested. And I used to play Yu-Gi-Oh! competitive for many years, right, and Magic and so on. And I also played with Hearthstone. Hearthstone has a card called Flame Strike, which is 4 damage to all enemy minions. I think it's 5 now since they buffed it. But back in the days, it was 4. The thing with Flame Strike is that people are so afraid, right? of you having flame strike on turn 7 or higher because you have 7 mana that they always play around it right and when I'm talking about getting away with it this is a perfect example because if you play like you have flame strike in your hand especially in arena mode almost everyone assumes that you're gonna have it right uh, so I played as I mentioned then these card games uh, for many many years especially magic and seed deck format and I won many many drafts and seed deck tournaments in my life and the reason why is because I always play like I have the correct card in my hand, more or less, right? So I play aggressively, and I would pretend that, we call it called bluffing, of course, right? Normally in poker, and pretending that, oh, I have the finisher, right? I have this card in my hand. And again, really, half is the perfect example of getting away with it, because you can play very aggressively, ignoring tempo, for example. So the way you do it in Hawthorne is that you ignore the opponent's uh, cards on the field, and go for the face right. If you do that, plus turn seven in Hearthstone Arena, especially back in Hearthstone was a new game, people would always assume that you have Flame Strike on your hand, right? So they start trading instead uh, with your minions because you think you're gonna Flame Strike their minions, which means that you don't have Flame Strike in your hand, but you get them to trade, right? Those kind of tempo, weird mental games are incredibly important, right? And of course, this concept of getting away with it is even stronger than in a multiplayer PvP game than in Fire Emblem Engage. Back to Fire Emblem and how to get away with it, so to speak. When I go to Jade, I have never employed her since then. Never, right? I have never even considered playing with Jade, because she's another tank. And the only way I could play with Jade is by removing Louis, right? Because there is no purpose having two tanks. I know I'm iterating the same thing here, but there's a good point to make. When I get the next ex wife, right? She's cute, she's adorable, kind of like a unique side wife to it. So I kind of want to play with her, but I immediately feel like, but I don't need another ex wife. I already got my Anna goes an ex, and barely that fits too much, also. Like, I barely want to have uh, an ex on Anna, right? Uh, and Lapis, as I keep going back to, right, in my previous video, is just so badly statted that I can use her, right? So it's more like a stat issue, but the other two is more like a class issue. But also, though, I made my last point saying that Lapis is unplayable, so to speak, because Kagetsu is a better Swordmaster, and that is absolutely factually true. However, Kagetsu is also basically useless, <laughs> so you can't have a result in having none of these characters whatsoever, not even the class, right? It's, only a, it's not only about the characters past them, right? it's also about what class they are, right? You don't need any of these three. So I hope this video made sense to people, right? My point is that if I could, right? I would have like triple Unica, triple Citrain, triple Ivy, right? That's about the purpose of all the characters, because most classes doesn't really fill a role, right? 
Um, it's all about like what can I do to maximize what I want to do, right? In a Fire Emblem game, it's about actually want to do damage. I don't actually want to tank. I don't want to you know, have more economy, whatever, right? Someone said you need to make money like Anna, but it's all about what can I do to get away with murder, right? How can I use a cat like Unica that does much, much more damage than the tanks because she creeps all the time and also takes less damage, right? It's amazing. How can I use a character with very, very high range damage or can I use it with a dancer and combine it? How can I use a cat that can both heal and damage and can fly and so on, utility, right? For example, as soon as I got Hortensia, right? The sister of Ivy, spoilers, whatever, I immediately used her instead, yeah. I was like, okay, out with whoever is the other character, right? So I ended up, as said, with more and more mages, more and more range units, right? Because that is, has way more effect, right? And if I can, I will literally use zero tanks on a chapter. Usually I end up having like one tank, which is Unica, right? Because it's a damage tank deal, right? And I think, I hope people understand the concept here of like, when you play a game like Fire Emblem, you don't want to use all the classes. There's no necessary need for doing that. Most classes are actually kind of useless. We can, we can talk about like actual like game balance issue of the game, right? That, for example, why would I use a hero when I can have another flying spellcaster? Like, that's actually an issue, right? Why would I use that? Why would I have a, a berserker when I can have yet another sage, basically? Because they're much more effective, right? So that, that is an issue of the game itself. But I just hope you understand where I'm coming from here, right? Both from the idea of like how do you play Hearthstone or how do you play Magic Gathering and Yu-Gi-Oh! so on. For example, I used to compete in Yu-Gi-Oh! was uh, Aniel, the Tenshi, Angel Fairy, it's called a Fairy in Europe, uh, Angel Fairy Counter Deck, right? So the Counter Deck has different triggers for different counters, and it's all about making your opponent believe that you have the right counter at the right time, so they don't, so they are afraid of actually playing who they, how they want to play, right? So you're forced them to play in a weird way. And I, can, and I can pretend again that I can bluff, right? Pretending I have the right counter. I hope people, you know, take something from this video, right? How to conceptualize a strategy. And like I said, I think this concept here applies to basically every strategy game, but especially, I say, strategy games where you have to build a deck, to speak, right? Or an army, right? Like in Fire Emblem, you don't have a deck, but you build your units, right? When you play Hearthstone, Magic, Yu Gi Oh!, you build a deck, right? When you play StarCraft, you build units. And I think that with StarCraft and other RTS games, they are similar because you usually have Fog of War, so you build your units in secret, right? That's why they're very similar to like a card game. Uh, of course, Fire Emblem is a single player game, so it's slightly different. So it's more about how can you get away with specific army position, right? Against the AI. And the last thing I want to say here and point out, so I think it's very important too, with Fire Emblem Engage, is that when I played through the chapter of Maddening, I also noticed that the faster you play them, and this might sound obvious, but the faster you play them, the easier they get, right? Because the biggest issue usually on Maddening, on many chapters, is when they, when they spawn, right? When they spawn the reinforcement. Suddenly, it's like five more enemies against you. And if you play the chapter twice, you, you know where they're going to spawn, which helps immensely. But the more thing I noticed, if I play way more aggressively, right, in Fire Emblem Engage, and I can remove more enemy units. Now when the new guys spawn, I can of course easier to care of them. So the more I play with like 10, 20, 11 damage focused units in Fire Emblem Engage, the easier it actually gets, right? So if you can maximize damage, and I will say one thing though, damage slash utility specifically for Fire Emblem Engage. Except the Hortensia with her like, you know, obstruct, rescue, warp and so on. So again, spellcast. Anyway, I hope this video was helpful and inspiring and just maybe helped you in, you know, conceptualize thinking about strategy games, generally speaking, right? And I think I have another video coming up later where I talk about strategies, uh, again, in general, with this Fire Emblem. So if you like the video, please subscribe, subscribe, share with you, all right, and have a great day.